Ten true units of blood, prep for an X-Lap and a sternotomy. Every second counts here, people, until we get this bleed stopped. This is my OR. Contrary to what Gray's Anatomy would have you believe, it's actually the anesthesiologist who manages blood transfusions in an operating room. In fact, anesthesiologists are responsible for the transfusion of about half of the blood products that are administered annually in the United States. My name's Max Feinstein, and I'm an anesthesiologist filming here at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, and in this video, I explain why and how transfusion medicine is such a crucial part of anesthesiology. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive in. As an anesthesiologist, my number one priority, regardless of any of the details of the surgery, is to get oxygen to a patient's vital organs, especially the heart and the brain. Oxygen is carried in the blood, and blood can be lost during surgery. In fact, blood can be lost for reasons that necessitate surgery. But either way, as an anesthesiologist, what I'm thinking about is that loss of blood potentially threatens my ability to get oxygen to a patient's vital organs. When we're talking about transfusing blood, we're generally not referring to transfusing what's called whole blood, which is if I were to go donate blood right now and then have that blood screened, it wouldn't be directly given to someone. Rather, it would be broken up into some of its component parts. Usually when people are talking about transfusing blood, they're referring to a specific part of the blood called packed red blood cells, or PRBCs. But there are a lot of other important components of the blood that are often transfused, including platelets, plasma, and cryoprecipitate, to name a few. If a transfusion is needed during surgery, but I don't need to give it as fast as humanly possible, then typically what I'll do is take the blood product, like packed red blood cells, hang them up on an IV pole, put it through a filter, a warmer, and then let it drip into a regular peripheral IV. By regular, I'm not referring to a large bore IV, but rather something like a 20 gauge IV that is routinely placed for anesthesia in adults. A warmer is important to use for certain blood products like packed red blood cells because those are stored in the refrigerator and if you give too much cold liquid to a patient, they can actually become cold, which can lead to problems like bleeding, which is what we're trying to avoid. An example of a scenario where I would transfuse a blood product in this slow manner would be a surgery, say, on the spine or some other bone that's really vascular, so it bleeds a fair amount, but not gushing blood, just sort of continuously for an extended period of time while the surgeon's operating. If blood is being lost during surgery at a faster rate, then what I might think about doing is putting a pressure bag around whatever product I'm transfusing and then inflating the pressure bag to make the blood product transfuse faster. However, at a certain point, one of my major limitations is going to be the size of the intravenous access that I have placed. For whatever size IV you're using, you can actually look at the manufacturer's label to see what the maximum flow rate is that you'll be able to achieve through that IV. So if you need to transfuse products faster than that maximum flow rate, then you need to have bigger IV access. That brings us to situations where we do have to transfuse blood products as fast as possible. And in those cases, you need to have the largest IV access available. And in many cases, that's going to be what's called a rapid infusion catheter, or a RIC. RICs can be quite large, and for that reason, they're placed either under general anesthesia or with local anesthesia for numbing medication if a patient's getting it awake. In a situation where there is massive hemorrhage on the operating field, for example, a trauma or a liver transplant surgery, then putting a pressure bag around my blood product is not going to be adequate for achieving a maximum transfusion rate. Instead, what I need is a device like this Belmont, which can transfuse at speeds up to 750 milliliters per minute. Just for reference, at that rate, you could transfuse an entire liter of liquid in about a minute and 20 seconds. Those are also going to be situations where you would typically activate a massive transfusion protocol, or MTP, which is done in coordination with the pathologists who run the blood bank. Activating a massive transfusion protocol entails having large volumes of a variety of blood products prepared and sent constantly to the operating room until we call the blood bank and tell them to stop. Big shout out to all the pathologists out there who play a critical role in transfusion medicine we never see each other because I'm always calling you from the operating room, but you've always been so helpful and I really appreciate what you do. In order to make a decision about transfusing, we need to combine clinical context along with labs and vital signs. 
When I talk about clinical context, I mean how quickly a patient is bleeding, and that means having great communication with the surgeon who can let me know if they happen to get into an artery or something else that's very bloody. If a surgeon does get into rapid bleeding, then I'm more likely to make the decision to transfuse regardless of what the labs look like because I know that the blood volume is dropping rapidly and I probably won't have time to draw labs and analyze them before I make the decision to transfuse. When things are not as urgent and I do have time to draw labs and analyze them to make a decision, one of the common labs that I look at is called an arterial blood gas which is a point of care test that I can do in the operating room pretty quickly to get a sense of many different components of the blood and especially how much hemoglobin, which is the oxygen carrying molecule, is present in the blood. It's also important to evaluate a patient's vital signs, especially their heart rate and their blood pressure, because if a patient is losing a very significant amount of blood, their blood pressure may actually drop and to compensate for that, their heart may pump faster. So you'll see the heart rate increase and the blood pressure go down in some circumstances. And even before a surgery starts, I may already have a higher suspicion that I'll need to transfuse blood products depending on what the surgery is. Some examples of surgeries with a higher risk of bleeding include what we call reoperations. For example, if a patient has already had their abdomen operated on two or three or four times, then when the surgeon cuts into it for the fifth time, it's going to bleed a lot more than the first time. And that's because the scar tissue that forms in the body is actually very vascular. So when surgeons cut through scar tissue from old surgeries, that tends to bleed more. There are also certain parts of the body that just have a lot of blood vessels going through them, and by virtue of that, they also tend to bleed more. Examples of that include obviously blood vessels, so vascular surgery, as well as the liver and certain bones tend to be very vascular as well. Transfusing blood products does come with a significant amount of risk, so it's not a decision that we take lightly. One risk that has become less of a problem in recent years due to advances in technology is transmission of infectious diseases from blood donors. In the United States, all blood products are screened for a variety of infectious diseases, and this screening is generally extremely effective, but there is still a very small chance of transmitting infectious diseases. It's literally a matter of life and death to make sure that a patient receives blood products that are compatible with their blood type. For that reason, patients either receive products that have been cross-matched for their specific type of blood, which is a rigorous type of screening test, or less commonly, patients will receive universal donor blood, which is O negative, which is much less likely to cause any type of transfusion reaction. That's typically reserved for extreme emergency situations where there hasn't been enough time to submit a patient's blood sample for cross-match to get matched blood for them. Another risk that has also improved with new technology is giving the wrong blood product to the wrong patient. Doing so can lead to a life-threatening transfusion reaction, but now with standardized and very rigorous protocols in place for transfusing blood products, this is much less likely to occur, and we also use barcode scanners that double check the blood products against the electronic medical record. All of this to say that the risk of getting the wrong blood product is extremely low these days. Transfusion of certain blood products can also alter the chemistry of the blood in ways that can be problematic unless we think ahead to address those. For example, packed red blood cells have an additive when they're stored that can actually cause the calcium level inside of blood to go down and having calcium go down can lead to really significant hypotension, meaning low blood pressure. So it's actually not unusual for anesthesiologists to administer calcium when packed red blood cells are being transfused. Another risk of transfusing blood products is causing a patient to develop what's called an antibody against certain elements that are in the blood. When a patient has an antibody in their blood, that can mean that they are not able to receive blood transfusions from certain donors in the future. Because of these and other risks that come along with transfusing blood products, it's really important that anesthesiologists have a conversation with their patients about the benefits and the risk of transfusing blood if needed. Of course, there can be situations where a patient is incapacitated, like a motor vehicle accident, where a blood transfusion is needed, but there's no way to have a discussion with the anesthesiologist. In those cases, transfusion consent is generally implied. There are also some patients who refuse to receive any transfusion of blood products, for example, on religious grounds. So that's another reason why it's really important that anesthesiologists include transfusion in the informed consent process where it's relevant. 
In addition to patients undergoing surgery, there are many patients who need blood products transfused outside of the operating room. Someone who is very close to me currently has a condition that requires that they get blood product transfusions in order to continue to stay alive. And for that reason, I'd encourage you to consider donating blood. If you're in the United States, you can check out the American Red Cross. I've left a link in the description below, and you can find out where the closest donation center is. It's pretty easy to donate blood, and it's literally life-saving, so I'd encourage you to think about doing it. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out this video that I made about cardiac surgery, which often involves transfusing blood products. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.